Welcome back to Judy Tuesdays here on CU at USC. Tonight, we're sitting down with Beverly Hills Mayor, John Mirisch. Welcome back to see you at USC. It's Judy Tuesdays and we're sitting down with Beverly Hills Mayor John Mearsh tonight. Thank you so much for coming, John. Well, thank you, Judy, for having me. Yes, of course. So aside from being the mayor of Beverly Hills, which is epic enough, you've had a pretty, pretty interesting career. Uh, so you actually grew up in Beverly Hills yourself. Mm -hmm. You went to Beverly Hills High School. Mm -hmm. Then you went to Yale University, graduated cum laude, Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, applause. And you were a movie executive at a couple of different studios. So IMAX, United International Pictures, Pictures yeah. Paramount, mm -hmm. and also you worked at 20th Century Fox. Mm -hmm. Wow, so that's a pretty phenomenal career. So what inspired the transition from the movie studios over to City Hall? Good question. Well, I actually was living abroad. I, I was uh, working in film distribution in Sweden. I moved back to the United States. I lived in Santa Monica for about a year, but then moved back to Beverly Hills where I'd grown up. And uh, I became involved again in what, what was going on at City Hall. I, I wasn't too thrilled with the, some of the decisions that were being made, and so I started a blog, and it was critical of a lot of the decisions. And so one thing led to another. Some, of the, some friends said, well, rather than just writing about something, why don't you try and get involved and maybe step up and take responsibility. And uh, I figured that was a good idea. And if I wasn't elected, at least people couldn't accuse me just of sort of um, criticizing from the sidelines. But I, I ended up winning. So that, that's what got me started over eight years ago. That's awesome. You mentioned that you um, were in Sweden. You actually have a dual citizenship mm -hmm. in Sweden. So how has your experience there impacted the way you I guess, govern the city of Beverly Hills? Well, I won't say that I govern. I, I, I'd like to think that I try and represent the residents. And uh, that's always been my philosophy about local government, or any government for that matter, is, is to put the residents first. Uh, uh, the way that our system works is that we have five council members, and we rotate as mayor. So you're elected to the council for a term of four years, and then you know, you'll be mayor one of those years, and maybe vice mayor one of those years as well. I do think Sweden has influenced me a lot. I, um, there, it's a wonderful place. It's got s some fantastic uh, values. It's got a very great system of values, I would say, and I think that's certainly a part of my identity, and that just informs all of everything that I do, the way I look at things, decision making, and that sort of thing, policy. That's so. awesome. What are some really big projects that you have coming up that you want to implement, I guess, some policies in Beverly Hills? So. I believe that Beverly Hills is a very special place, and part of that is obviously because I grew up there, so I'm very sentimental about it. But I, I think there's a stereotype of Beverly Hills, and then there's the Beverly Hills that we who, who live there know. And really, there's no place like it. And I lived abroad, and I, I spent a lot of time in other places, and Beverly Hills is entirely unique. And so my goal is, quite simply, to try and protect that which makes our city so special. And there's really a kind of a small town charm to Beverly Hills. People who live there, you know, we, we play geography. Um, it's funny, um, I'll drive down the streets and very often other people will look at maps, kind of maps to stars homes. Oh, Debbie Reynolds lived there and uh, Lucille Ball lived there. But, but for me, it's, it's very different. I'll, I'll drive down there with my son and I'll say, oh, the Belisovs live there and the Ezralos live there. And, so it's really a sense of being connected. And mm -hmm. the fact that we have that feeling of being connected and that sense of, um, of belonging in a city or a, a metropolitan area with 10 million people is special and it's unique. And some people describe Beverly Hills as kind of like Mayberry RFD. 
Um, others describe it as Peyton Place. So it, it, it all depends on your perspective, but it is a very special and unique place. So my goal is to make sure that those elements that make it such a special place, that we continue to um, foster those elements and make sure that people who grew up there have the same kind of experience, that they feel connected with each other, they feel a true sense of community. Beyond that, we're, we're looking to one thing that I, I feel strongly about is using technology to try and help improve the lives of our residents. So we're installing municipal fiber to the premises, so the city is actually going to every single residence and every single business and is going to provide you know, us the opportunity to have extremely high internet speeds and that will help businesses. It will also help people who maybe aren't so thrilled with the cable company. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will also allow us to um, use the Internet of Things with the infrastructure of the city. We're also looking at using closed circuit cameras throughout the city. We already have them in the business areas, but also adding it to the, the residential areas to increase public safety um, as a force multiplier for our police. And, and finally, when it comes to technology, among the things we're doing, and I think it's the most exciting because it has the most potential, is the use of autonomous vehicles within public transportation. And mm -hmm. last April, we were the first city in the U.S. to pass a, unanimously pass a resolution that said that we want to develop our own municipal autonomous shuttle system, which is effectively a, a, a municipal system that will take you from point A to point B on demand within the city. And part of the problem with uh, public transportation in the LA region is it's really a second class form of transportation mm -hmm. because it's inconvenient, because you have to make great adjustments to the system. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to turn public transportation into a first choice for mobility by making it convenient, by making it uh, something that people are going to want to use and not something that people have to use. And the idea of using driverless cars, which will also solve what's known as the first and last mile challenge because we're getting a subway station, you got to get to and from the subway. Mm -hmm. uh, it originated as a first last mile solution, but I think we've seen that the potential applications go well beyond that. It can help children with mobility, it can help seniors, it can help disabled people. And it will also, if it does become a first choice of mobility, as we're hoping, that means people will leave their cars at home. And when people start to leave their cars at home, that helps solve traffic problems. And of course, that's something that all of us in the LA region are hoping for. That's, oh yeah, that's very true. So this is an autumn, um, this is like a driverless metro that people are using. And then you're also, um, you know, I guess you could say pushing for driverless car vehicles that are individual. So the subway that's coming through is MTA. It's just the purple line. It's the extension. And there'll be two stations in Beverly Hills. Is this underground? Underground. And oh, people nice. need to get to and from. And that's the Regional Transit Authority, the MTA. But how do you get to and from? Now, many stations have park and rides, but those were never planned for Beverly Hills. We asked. They said, sorry, we're not going to do it. And so we thought we, we need to figure out our own solution as to how our residents can get to and from the subway stations and how visitors can get to and from the stations to wherever their destinations are. And so as said, uh, over a year and a half, almost two years ago, I wrote an article in the LA Business Journal um, with laying out how we should take advantage of this emerging technology to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And we have now our tech tech committee is on board and uh, we're really excited. We got the whole council on board and it's something that hopefully we'll be able to actually uh, turn into reality within five to seven years. Is this something that you hope will kind of revolutionize public transportation around the country and is Beverly Hills kind of the pioneer city to try this out? So we're driven by innovation. We always want to set the standards whether it comes to transparency in government, whether it comes to t use of technology, when it comes to good government. I mean, that's our goal is to set, in the, set uh, to be a model and to set the example uh, as to what government can do. And personally, I believe local government, it's the best form of government if done right because it's closest to the people. It's, it's about home. I mean, what is closer to us than home? And so we are absolutely hoping to serve as an example. And at the U.S. Conference of Mayors last year in June, mm -hmm. I actually authored a resolution, and it passed unanimously, uh, urging cities to think about this and to integrate um, autonomous vehicle technology into public transportation. 
And at the last U.S. Conference of Mayors, just last month in Washington, it's a subject that from last June to January, people are talking about, and there's an excitement, and there is momentum. And so uh, it, it's, it's, it's very exciting to think that we were part of the original group that has been pushing this technology. It's also going to change the way we plan cities, urban planning, for example. And uh, that's also exciting to think of the potential. Yeah, so on the flip side, um, we've got all this emerging technology with public transportation, uh, but you mentioned Beverly Hills is a very charming city. And did you recently oppose um, a high-rise um, building, basically, that was going to be built out of basically um, fear that it would change kind of the vibe of the city? Well, if a city is run correctly, it has something that's called a general plan, and that's essentially a blueprint for development in the city. And you know, there are 88 cities in Los Angeles County, and each city should determine the kind of city it wants to be. I mean, from, the, from its inception, Beverly Hills has been a, as said, this sort of charming uh, city, and it's low-rise, human-scale, and livable. And that's what mm -hmm. the general plan, which I helped the latest version co-write in 2011, envisions the city as. So um, there, you know, to paraphrase Ecclesiastes, there's a time and a place for everything. And there is a time and a place to densify and to build skyscrapers. But if you want to build a skyscraper, go to Century City, go to maybe the Wilshire Quarter, go to downtown LA, go to Dubai. Mm -hmm. It's not appropriate for Beverly Hills. So it's something that I actually did oppose very vocally for that reason and no other reason. And uh, the developer spent upwards of $10 million trying to push this. And that's think of it, that's more than $1,000 per vote. And this will bring us into perhaps another subject of discussion, which is the polluting influence of money within our political system. Mm -hmm. Ninety percent of the times that uh, one side spends more money, they win an election. This is one of those 10 percent, though, because uh, of a grassroots effort, we were able to inform our residents, and it lost 56 to 44 percent. So it really... Oh people saw through it. It was really a scheme and it wasn't good and it was only good for the developer and not good for the city. And so we really need to be thinking long term about what is appropriate uh, for, for a city. And there are places where a, a skyscraper is absolutely appropriate, just, just not in Beverly Hills. Okay. Aside from the, you know, traditional the stereotypical Rolls Royce and some, you know, Melrose shopping. What makes Beverly Hills so much different than the other cities in LA County? So Melrose is Los Angeles. It starts at the border of LA, but Rodeo oh. Drive is Beverly Rodeo. Hills. <laughs> and everyone's seen the Beverly Hill Billies or 90210. And, and yeah. you know, it's not just swimming pools and movie stars. In fact, what most people don't know is 55 to 60 percent of our residents are renters. Yes, there are areas of the city that are, you know, the uber wealthy and, mm -hmm. and, and very luxurious. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also, it's a very diverse city. We have people from, I think, 35 percent of our residents were born abroad. And it's a very international community. And it's not just an enclave of the ultra wealthy. And it's a very welcoming city. But as said, I think what makes it so special, aside from the history and the connection with Hollywood and the film industry, which is, is sort of something that is part of the DNA of the city, and I think it's important for us to continue with that, is the sense of connectedness that everybody feels. It really does somehow feel like a small town. And it's a small town with glamour and cosmopolitan uh, shopping and all of that superimposed, and it's a very unique combination. I, People have heard of, I've been all around the world, and people have heard of Beverly Hills literally everywhere I've ever been. People know where Beverly Hills is. I, mm -hmm. I don't know that you could say that about many other cities. Yeah, it's very iconic. Yeah. We'll be taking a quick break. Make sure you stay tuned, and we'll be back to discuss more with Beverly Hills Mayor Bill Muirish. John Welcome back to the CU. We have Beverly Hills Mayor John Mears here, and we're going to talk a little bit more about your experience in the film industry. We're here at the best film school on the planet, and um, tell us and the viewers a little bit more about your um, background in film internationally. Mm -hmm. 
and um, how this has impacted your career as mayor? Well, most of my career was spent in film distribution, so it wasn't on the production side, although I have a lot of family members who have been and continue to be involved with that. And so I lived abroad and I, I uh, ran UIP, which is United International Pictures, in both Austria first and then in Sweden. And UIP was a joint venture between, still is, between Paramount and Universal. And so we would get all of their movies and we would release them in those countries and market them and work with exhibitors to get them on screen. And, and when I moved back, I worked with uh, IMAX here and then Paramount and again in the international sphere. So it's fascinating being someone who's from here, you know, mm -hmm. literally I was born in Hollywood. It was Cedars of Lebanon at the time, it's in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and who grew up here and then living abroad and seeing the influence of American movies uh, abroad and how, how well beloved they are, but also getting a chance to work with Austrian filmmakers because we would distribute sometimes Austrian films and Swedish movies. And um, obviously the medium of entertainment films, storytelling is something that people uh, appreciate around the world. Okay. And you started at 20th Century Fox. Were you as in a trainee? Yeah. A trainee, I was yeah. going to say that, or an intern in Germany? Yeah. Awesome. What advice would you give students that are interested in getting into film and distribution? Well, distribution is something that, again, that it's certainly things are changing now because there's a lot more digital distribution. It's not just movie going in a movie theater. Now, that to me is always going to be an experience that I hope will live on forever because there's really something special about being in a movie theater and seeing a story and being there with other people. It's a shared experience. And, uh, but the advice I'd give to anyone who would like to get involved with film distribution of any kind or films or anything is just do something that you're passionate about. Do something that you love. It seems to be the most obvious thing in the world, but this is also one of the reasons I got involved in, I guess you could call it local politics. I look at it as public service. Uh, I, I almost didn't feel it was something like I wanted to do the way, you know, oh, I, I want to go to Tahiti someday or something like that. I kind of felt it was like something I had to do. And I think that, that when people, when, when young people have the feeling that it's something that they have to do, they need to listen to that inner voice. And is that some advice you would give to a student that wanted to get involved in public service? Absolutely. And, or, or acting. I mean, if, you know, you don't, you don't become an actor because you want to. You do it because it's something you feel you have to do. Mm, okay. What would you want your legacy to be as mayor? Um, I know there's elections March 7th, mm -hmm. they're coming up. Mm -hmm. And also, what do you have to say to viewers about? Well, I'm, I'm running for re election. This would be the third term that I'm doing. And I, I feel I represent a unique voice on our council. And without getting too into inside baseball, um, I, I think I represent what I will call a pro-resident voice. I think City Hall sometimes gets to be very introspective and forgets the reason it exists. Mm -hmm. City Hall exists to serve all of us, mm -hmm. not the other way around. I mean, we've all heard the expression, you can't fight City Hall. I mean, think how absurd that is. You shouldn't have to. City Hall is there for us. And so my f entire philosophy of local government, you can call it a slogan, but it's truly what I believe, is putting residents first. I believe that's what I have tried to do. That's what I continue to try to do. And I, I sometimes think I'm the only voice on the council that really takes that position. It's an important voice that needs to be heard, whether it has to do with the use of technology within the city to improve residents' lives, or fiscal responsibility, or transparency. I mean, at a local level, we have a pension crisis that is threatening the entire state. And Sometimes I'm the only one who talks about it. You do need to sometimes have the, the people there who are willing to speak up and, and, and talk about the hard truths. Mm -hmm. What are some misconceptions that people might have about the city? That's a beautiful city hall, by the way. <laughs> of course it would be. What are some misconceptions that people might have about the city that you would like to clear up? Well, I think it's the stereotype that it's just a, a city of ultra-rich people or spoiled or self-entitled, and it really isn't that at all. It's, as said, it's a, a small town sometimes with the focus of the world because of the fact that it's connected to Hollywood. But it's, it's, that's why I keep saying there's really, there's no place in the world like Beverly Hills. And for those of us who are lucky enough to live there, it's home. There's no place like home. So that's, that's how I come at it. And I think it's, it's sometimes difficult to uh, counteract some of the stereotypes, which, which really aren't true. Okay. 
Now you've had a very, very, very phenomenal career. Um, starting off um, living in Beverly Hills, going to Yale, getting into film, and now being mayor. For those who are wondering, what could possibly be next for you? Well, hopefully on March 7th, uh, the residents, <laughs> third term. well, the residents will, uh, you know, affirm the, the work that I've done and, and my goals for the next four years, and I'll continue to be on the council. And, uh, you know, beyond that, I, I still am connected with the entertainment industry, and, uh, you know, they're, I'm willing to explore all sorts of things. I, I feel like the eight years that I've been in, I like to call it public service, are almost like a PhD in, in public policy. I, I feel... Uh, it's it's opened me to so many interesting things. Uh, running a city like Beverly Hills is uh, is a big deal. I mean, we have 1,100 employees. Think about that in a city with 35,000 residents, and we do everything from have a, our own police and fire department to pave the streets to public works to transportation to urban planning, and uh, with a very active and involved group of residents, it, it's very very interesting. I, I'm fascinated by the way that um, cities are planned in development, and as said, you, I, I think you heard before that um, developing a municipal autonomous shuttle system is kind of a passion project. Mm -hmm. I do think it can transform not just in Beverly Hills transportation, but in Southern California, and I think ultimately it can lead to the democratizing of transportation, and that is very exciting. So that's something I really do hope to be able to pursue um, beyond March. Awesome. How long do you think it would take to kind of implement that um, transportation the system? The, it, it's very difficult to say. I mean, the technology is there. It, it, it's something that it will happen in phases and steps, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the initial steps could happen very soon, you know, where you're probably going to need initially a driver, at least someone there. And as that technology um, becomes more developed, it's something that you can then in, in sort of phase it in. Would there be residents that could volunteer to be the first ones to try the system? Well, I, I think and hope that once we have something ready for prime time, everyone's going to want to try it because it's kind of, I'm kind sure of exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but our first subway station is scheduled to open in 2023. So that's six years away and my hope would be we would have something in place by then. Okay. What's been the biggest challenge of your career so far as mayor? Well, I, I do think it is, um, as I mentioned, it's the role of money, uh, ultimately the role of money in politics, mm -hmm. and how that, um, you know, we've all heard of lobbyists and special interests, and they're very powerful forces that are trying to get decisions made that don't necessarily benefit the residents of the city, but benefit clients or benefits, you know, smaller groups. And I think it's difficult within our system, there's a systemic problem, to resist that, and, and that certainly... Uh, my goal is to make decisions, to have common sense decisions that benefit everybody and not just certain people. And it's sometimes difficult to get that balance. Development issues are, are very big ones. You mentioned the skyscraper and when you have a developer that is only thinking about their own profits and pocketbooks and don't care uh, about the impact that, for example, a 375 foot skyscraper are going to have on our city, to fight that when they are spending $10 million in a city with 35,000 people, that is a challenge. That's not easy. And um, mm -hmm. I, I do think that, and I also mentioned to you, I think another issue that's facing us, but it's also facing basically all cities in California, is how do we fund the pensions of public employees? It's, it's a system that is ultimately unsustainable. And it's something that we all are going to collectively have to have the political will to do something about. And ultimately, we're probably going to have to move public employees from what are known as defined benefit pensions, where you get a certain percentage of your salary um, to 401k style defined contribution pensions. You have to think that up until a couple years ago, certain employees could get 99% of their highest salary for life at the age of 50. Mm -hmm. This is something that is simply not sustainable. The taxpayers are, are not going to be able to finance something like that in the long run. And so there have been small attempts to try and do reforms on the statewide level. They're very, they've been very minor, nibbling at the edges, nothing systemic. We're going to need to do more. Or we're going to see, unfortunately, a lot of cities that are going to be in, in deep trouble providing services to their residents. Okay. And um, if there were no limitations, this one could be like a fun, fun one. If there were no limitations, what would you want to do with the city 
if you just you could do anything. It's, it's, it's an interesting question, but I, I don't feel limited now. I mean, sometimes we're limited because you have to get three votes on the council. There are five council members, and you have to get to three votes. And mm -hmm. there have been measures I've proposed that have been rejected. I've, we had in Beverly Hills no historic preservation, for example, when I got on the council. And I proposed it, and it was rejected. But ultimately, we were able to get to three votes, and now we have one of the most robust uh, historic preservation programs in the state. So it is a case sometimes of persistence overcoming resistance and I, I, I just love our city so much because as said I feel that sense of connection and I want my nine-year-old son who's a fifth generation resident and that that may not be a lot in Europe but for a city that's only hundred and three years that is a, a sense of from generation to generation I want us who, who understand what makes our city so special to be able to share that to the next generation and for that to keep on going and I think mm -hmm. it's something that we're willing to, and we do, we share with the entire world because we're a very welcoming and open community and we love visitors and we love for people to experience it. But as said, when, when, when we walk down streets and think of the sense of history that pervades it, and not just Hollywood history, and a lot of that is there and it's fascinating, but personal history. And I can tell my uh, son that my great-grandfather lived here. It's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling of home. And, to me, that's what this is about. It's about home, mm -hmm. and home's almost a sacred concept. Awesome. Well, hopefully, the next time any of you viewers visit Rodeo Drive or anywhere near Beverly Hills, we can catch you on the streets. I'll ask you for a picture. Um, thank you so much for coming. This is the mayor of Beverly Hills, John Mirisk, here on CU at USC, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you, Judy, and fight on. Yes, fight on. <laughs> Welcome to see you at USC.